Okay. All right. So start off, uh, my name's Brian. I'm from the uh, emergency medicine department. I've met most of you. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I feel honored you asked me to come, especially Dr. Hecker. Uh, he's probably my favorite lecturer that we get in the ER. I, I'm the academic chief uh, for our program, uh, so I'm giving a lot of lectures there, uh, but I don't get the opportunity to come talk with you guys or hang out with you very often. So thanks for having me. Hope this is helpful. Um, when I was like thinking about this lecture and what to talk about and try to make it relevant for you, I was kind of wanting to set the stage a little bit and why I think this topic over other ones uh, was kind of an interesting thing to talk about. Um, and to start off, I was thinking like from the like most rudimentary standpoint of residency, like why do we do this? And secondarily, like why is ULH a great place to work? And I think this can open up like a really interesting discussion, uh, but I'll kind of just talk about a couple points here. I think the main goal of residency training for me, uh, and maybe others and people I've talked about this that kind of agree, is that, you know, you can practice uh, right out of medical school. Uh, it's not too difficult in our day and age to look up some things on a computer if you have a, a chief complaint or something you're suspicious about and you read about what you should do and what workup should be done. And a lot of mid-level providers essentially do that after very little experience. And they do a great job most of the time. So like, why do we slave over for three years, in a lot of your cases six years because you're doing fellowships, and uh, sacrifice sleep and time with our families and our personal health. And I think, I think the reason is um, it gives us an opportunity to see some rare manifestations of serious disease that we otherwise wouldn't get the opportunity to see. And part of the reason I think ULH is awesome is this is just a hotbed of very rare and serious medical conditions. And talking uh, with some of the previous people that have graduated from here, I remember uh, Burke was telling me that this place is like a hub of research that just hasn't been done. You look at other ivory towers of learning and there's like all these different studies and interventions and things they're looking at and there's so many people that are interested, there's almost like lack of procedures to go around. Here it's like we have the opposite problem, like we're in the trenches, we don't have enough residents, like everyone's sick and our shock index for this hospital, I don't know if you guys know this, is actually extremely high. And if you look at other penetrating trauma one facilities, we're probably the highest on the list. And what I mean by that is the acuity level of the people that come into the hospital and thereafter leave soon after. So if you compare us to like Detroit or other these medical centers like St. Louis um, that get equal amounts of penetrating trauma and serious medical conditions, they're admitting a lot more people because they have a lot bigger hospitals. We have only so much bed volume here and we're constantly getting the push to exit people out of the hospital probably sooner than they should be. Um, but what that translates to us is, is we have to figure out what patients need and uh, what they absolutely need before they go home. And uh, so we get kind of an interesting uh, look into medical treatment that we wouldn't otherwise get. This talk is mainly about syncope and EKGs. And the reason I'm going to talk about this is because we always are looking at EKGs. Uh, like every day that we see a patient, it's hard not to look at an EKG. You guys are seeing these in clinic. You're looking at past medical records. You're ordering them on the floor for anyone with chest pain, anyone with shortness of breath, anyone that's bradycardic, you're looking at an EKG. And sometimes you'll spend 15 seconds looking at it because you don't have a whole lot of time. And other times maybe you'll pontificate over it for a minute, minute and a half. But not a ton of time. But in that time, I'm going to talk about some conditions that if you learn some tricks, you can pick them up and potentially save lives. Um, and I'm not talking about lives of someone who's like 80, 90 years old on the hospice uh, that's going to die eventually. I'm talking about like healthy 25, 35-year-olds um, that could drop dead in a month if you don't pick this up and miss it. Most often these are missed. The reason why we're at a special uh, kind of stance to pick these up is a lot of these conditions will present and precipitate in the setting of acute distress. And that can be tox. It can be sickness, it can be trauma. And like those three things are often components of every single patient that comes into our ED and then sometimes comes to the floor to see you guys. So um, overall, I think this is a really neat thing to do and I think we can uh, make a huge impact. And I'm very passionate about learning these rare conditions because if you pick up one in 10 years, like you made a huge difference. And I think that's why we do residency. So uh, this is like uh, kind of like 
setting the stage a little bit, like when you're going to be using this. And there's many, many other things, but I know a few of you are moonlighting or have been moonlighting, and you work at these urgent clairs, and you have these like very low risk chest pains that come in like all the time, and it's never an issue. And you see sinus rhythm on the ECG, and you're done. They go home, and almost 100% of the time, I'm sure they do fine. And you just give them a little bit of anxiety medication. So you have a 25 year old with chest pain. It's atypical at rest. 20-year-old female with anxiety with maybe some syncope or pre-syncope, like how do you work this up? What are you really looking for on the EKG? So when we order the EKG, are we looking for ischemia? The answer is absolutely not. You're not looking for ischemia primarily on someone that comes in very young with chest pain or syncope. You're looking for it, of course, but it's not the primary concern. A few of the things you gotta watch out for um, are these rare manifestations of serious disease that unless you're trained in it, unless you're practiced at it, unless you've seen multiple presentations of real world examples, you're gonna miss 100% of the time. So goals, more than just the young person because you guys are internal medicine, so a lot of the people you're taking care of have a ton of comorbidities. So the side portion of this discussion is uh, the syncope elderly patient. What do we do with these? What is the real mortality? Should we admit all of these in a hospital that's already hard pushed for beds? Like, when do these need to come in? And what does the evidence say? When, uh, when is it something that we should even be consulting you? When is it an inappropriate consult from the ED? And so a lot of this will kind of give you um, a little bit of ammunition for where we're coming from and uh, why we're calling you. Um, and also gives you kind of an, a basis of what we should be calling you about. And so when we call you about this patient that looks ill and maybe we don't verbalize it, uh, you can ask, well, did you do these things? And if they haven't done it, then, well, maybe the workup's not complete, or maybe they'll find something they need to go to a different service. Uh, we're going to talk about some rare manifestations of serious disease that's related to syncope as well as uh, chest pain. Uh, I talked with a couple of you, and it sounds like um, some of these conditions Dr. Brown has talked about. So what I'm going to focus on um, is hokum, ARVD, Will Parkinson White, Pre-Excitation Syndrome, Long QT, and Brigada. Now, these, these names are familiar to most of you, and you can pick up the typical textbook presentation, but most of the time, when these present, they're not textbook. Like, for instance, ARVD, your epsilon wave that's like part of your hard criteria for that, it's only there 30% of the time. So if you're gonna see an ARVD, which is an incidence of one in 5,000, which you may see a few in your career, that you're probably gonna miss, if there's any chance that you could pick it up, it's not gonna be on the epsilon wave, most likely. So, we're gonna go deep. Real deep, we're not just looking for the epsilon waves in ARVD or the LVH in HOCAM or the delta waves in WPW. I'm gonna talk about what uh, characteristics and patterns that you should be looking for. And once you start doing this, you can look at an EKG and in like 20, 25 seconds, immediately rule out all of these five. And in every single EKG that you pick up for someone that's feeling sick, uh, presyncopal, um, chest pain, like you should, you should look at all of these. And then I would document it medical legally on anyone that's very young or any syncope patient. The reason for that is a lot of the criteria we use to decide if someone needs admission for one of these illnesses deal specifically with these. So if we don't comment on the chart that they don't have them, then it looks like we didn't evaluate for it. Um, and then, like I said, paint a picture of these syndromes so we can pick them up. And then uh, everyone talks about like orthostatics in the setting of syncope. I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that and the evidence for orthostatics and when we should do them. And then if everything's negative, like does this patient still need to come in? Like are we just gonna obs them for 24 hours and discharge them in the morning? It's not a lot of extra work for everyone. When do we absolutely need to bring them in? And then my goal is to basically deliver care to everyone I see in the ED like I would my own family. So. When I practice out of the ED, and I've worked with a lot of you, I'm, I'm very passionate about doing what is absolutely evidence-based and trying to rid myself of traditional-based practice that's not rooted in evidence. So I, I tried to bring a little bit of evidence into this. With the constraints of time, um, I, left, I tried to only include what was pertinent and useful. Um, so about orthostatics, I have three references here that kind of uh, have helped me to define my own practice on it. Uh, this doctor here did a, a really good rundown summary of the evidence a few years back. Uh, it's freely available. It's a video uh, over his lecture, and he, he publishes on this as well. Um, but basically, the summary of orthostatics, and I'll talk about the evidence right after, it's like 50% sensitive and specific. Um, so people that have 
uh, significant volume loss, like or uh, will not present with positive orthostatics, and people that have no volume loss, half of them will present with positive orthostatics. So roughly 50% of people will be orthostatic by measurements when they are asymptomatic and have absolutely no volume loss. The corollary is that many patients with moderate volume loss will not be orthostatics by measurements in spite of being symptomatic. His, his argument is maybe it'd be better to see if they're symptomatic when they stand up more than anything, uh, but overall, like, even if they are, you cannot chalk a syncope up to orthostatics unless you are 100% certain that you've ruled out all these other rare manifestations of serious disease. Um, and some of the more, like, pertinent evidence, because we see a lot of patients in the ED that we're doing orthostatics on, uh, taking 132 random patients with no history of volume loss, basically, like, these are patients coming in for med refills that look good, vital signs are normal. Um, 43% of them that were euvolemic had positive orthostatics, like completely useless. That's given us like a 43% uh, false positive rate. So what does that do for us? Well, that means if these patients came in uh, with syncope, let's say they're 40 years old and they have positive orthostatics, that's a really... That's a really easy thing to do is to just give them IV fluid and say, oh, you're 40 years old. Like, man, you're just a little bit fluid down, dehydrated. We'll give you some fluid to send you home. Like, you look great. Everything else is coming back normal. Well, what about the nursing home patients? So here's a study of 900 nursing home patients. 50% of them had positive orthostatics at baseline. These are people that are uh, uh, euvolemic at the time, and there was markers used to determine that they were euvolemic. What about children? Well, 40% of children are positive baseline. So you look at your three uh, intervals of medical practice, children, uh, young adults, as well as late adults, and they all, across the board, orthostatics uh, are not very good. JAMA summary of the best evidence uh, regarding these articles, as well as a lot of others that have been done, is basically um, in their meta-analysis, they said that orthostatics are probably less than a quarter sensitive for acute moderate blood loss. All right, so orthostatics, neither sensitive nor specific. We've established that. I don't think anyone would argue with that anymore after the evidence that's come out over the last 15 years. Um, so what, what, what can it do, though, if we're getting all these orthostatics measurements in the ED? And a lot of experts say that not even to get them unless you are profoundly concerned that they are volume down. Probably a better idea nowadays would check the IVC, do a passive leg raise, stuff that we do in the ICUs. The reason we don't want to do it is... First, you can miss volume loss in our patients that are septic or GI bleeds, but the most important thing for this talk is it can anchor bias your diagnosis and lead you away from what you really need to be doing for the patient. So kind of to paint a picture for you, this is a patient that we had recently. I changed some of the specifics. Um, 70 year old male, heart failure, diabetes, blood pressure at triage was low, but like he runs kind of low. His labs looked normal. He presented with syncope symptoms. Uh, normal ECG, at least it was documented that way. Uh, has a history of uh, low blood pressure, he says. Orthostatics were mildly positive. He was given fluids. There was a consult um, for admission versus uh, evaluation. He looked really good. Uh, he was sent home. The last thing for a patient like this um, with these comorbidities is to recommend just IV fluids and home without like further assessment of something or near-term follow-up. In fact, after this talk, I think you'll agree that this patient should unanimously have come in uh, based on some of the uh, admission characteristics that we're going to talk about. This patient, uh, this patient went home and died um, shortly thereafter within 24 hours. The question that I had was like, how often could this be happening? How often can we expect it to happen based off the literature? If we send someone home and they die, that might not necessarily be a bad outcome if it's only going to happen one in a thousand times. So I'm going to talk with you about how often we can expect this. Overall summary, syncope sucks. Like, everyone talks about, like, what do you hate working at the most in emergency medicine? And, like, for me, like, I think the greatest enigma is abdominal pain in an elderly woman. Like, it can be, like, literally anything. But a lot of people hate syncope because it can be a lot of things, and there's a lot of things you really got to rule out. And if you're doing a good job, then you probably are, like, checking, like, new medicines that have been added on board and running, like, cross-checks on the medicines that they're on and looking through past medical history, and it takes a lot of time to do a good job. Um, it can be difficult to determine who needs to come in, even when you have the whole picture. The rule that's most commonly used, and most of you are aware of this, is San Francisco syncope rule. Uh, how, show of hands, how many people use this commonly? 
How many people think it's a bunch of crap? Yeah, so there's some recent evidence, uh, sort of recent, like five, ten years ago that came out that said in one of the randomized control trials that said maybe syncope, San Francisco syncope is not nearly as sensitive or specific as it was first publicized to be. But even in that study, and we'll talk maybe a little about that, they still had a 60 or 70 percent sensitivity for all the people that died checked out, and their end was very small. But fortunately for us is there's been uh, multiple made analysis that included that study as well as a bunch of others. And they're really kind of painting a picture that we should be using San Francisco syncope more. And that's, this is a change in practice for me because I stopped using it after reading that uh, more recent article that some of you may be talking about. But I think we should probably go back to on it based on the highest level of evidence, which is the meta analysis. Um, so the largest study validated, uh, it was like uh, over a thousand individuals. Outcome was uh, measured at seven days, and this is a lot of the stuff that you read. Uh, we'll talk about this study in particular, but a lot of the other confirmatory studies and assessment studies have been up to 30 days post-discharge. Overall, the rule had a 96% sensitivity, very high specificity given that the, the goal of this rule was to catch as many as possible, uh, but not as be very specific. Native predicted value is obscenely high, 99.2%. That's higher than PERC. Um, and then uh, positive predicted value of 25%. So what does that mean, positive predicted value of 25%? Like, that's freaking huge. What that means is 25% of people that are San Francisco syncope rule positive will have a bad outcome, which includes death, and I'll talk about what the outcomes are, uh, within seven days of discharge. So this is not like one in 100, one in 200. This is a quarter of the patients that present with syncope or pre-syncope that have any of the comorbidities that's defined by San Francisco. It's, it's pretty big, which is why a lot of these people should be admitted. And I'd argue probably all of them unless they have very near-term follow-up. Um, serious outcome in this study, you know, about 10% uh, of the patients had a bad outcome. Um, they define it as death, MI, PE, stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, significant hemorrhage, or any condition causing a return to ED, and then a hospitalization. So it wasn't like, oh, I returned to the ED because like, I need a med refill or I got a strep throat or something. It's like these people came back and were admitted. So this is uh, one of the more recent like, meta-analysis I could find. This is 2011. There's another one from 2013. Um, they included all these different studies you can see here. And, uh, the reason I brought this up here is to show you like the outcome measurement kind of varies. Like some are by one uh, week, some are by three months, some are by like a month. But they used uh, the initial criteria, which was like bad outcome uh, defined as like MI, re or recurrent admission, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, death, and a lot of these ended up dying. Aggregate analysis, they found that San Francisco syncope rule um, was pretty good. Um, so, like, if you discharge someone uh, that's San Francisco negative, you have an overall 5% chance that the patient's going to have a bad outcome, so 1 in 20. It's not terrible. It's not as good as we'd want it to be, though. But if you apply it to patients that had negative everything else on their workup, like, for instance, they're coming in with syncope, pure syncope, and don't have a uh, concurrent, like, pneumonia, or a GI bleed or something that's bringing them there for that. If they have absolutely nothing on their workup that's done in the ED, if you apply San Francisco to it, your miss rate's one in 50. So that's pretty good. What is San Francisco's uh, syncope rule? Defined by the chest pneumonic. So it's not active heart failure, it's history of heart failure. And that can kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like that's probably the one that's most in question, but we talked about this more recently with a kind of a cohort about uh, this particular rule and applying the ED. And what we kind of came to after looking at a lot of the evidence was that if someone is coming into the ED that's got a history of heart failure that presents with syncope, that's a high-risk patient. If that's their chief complaint and they have a frickin', they have a heart history, like you gotta, you gotta do some further testing because the likelihood of you missing something, that patient dying is pretty high. 20% of the people in the meta-analysis came in with just history of heart failure. Uh, about 30% of them were OBS over the night and discharged in the morning, and a significant amount, 40 to 50% had a cardiac event overnight that required uh, intervention. So it could be like exacerbation of heart failure that didn't present upon arrival. Um, and it could have been just an arrhythmia. I recently had someone that came in with this with bradycardia that developed a spontaneous um, uh, third-degree heart block. 
that was intermittent. It wasn't present on the first EKG. It ended up getting a pacemaker. It was the weirdest thing. But old people, history of heart failure, syncope, bad news. E is for EKG. Now, this is the one that I think we probably mess up the most often in the ED. And I'm going to teach you guys what we need to evaluate uh, for the E to be negative. And uh, basically, it's ruling out those five conditions. And we'll get to those like right now. S is for shortness of breath. If they, if they say they feel short of breath or dyspneic, that's a higher risk patient. And then presenting blood pressure in around 90 or below that, that patient's got to come in. Very high risk. We do an M&M every month. I don't know if you guys do these uh, for patients that we've consulted you on or that have been in the hospital and like what happens after, you know, two days, three days. Unfortunately, our M&M ends at the 72 hour mark and some of the data we get doesn't include everyone that's been seen in the hospital and gets readmitted or has a bad outcome because they go to different hospitals. Uh, but what we see, and it's kind of a continual trend, is elderly people that come in with an initial consult of syncope, if they had low blood pressure at triage, they almost all did bad. The heart failure, is that systolic or diastolic? It's, uh, it was defined in a lot of them as systolic, but some of the neurostuff is using bad diastolic as well. So basically, if they're on medications for heart failure, like that's the patient you want to watch out for. If they've got a pre-diagnosis of heart failure and it's being actively managed, those are the people you want to worry about. Um, so <laughs> this is the EKG criteria that the studies use. Like, you have to rule out every single one of these before you can say the E in syncope uh, San Francisco is negative. And like... I know personally, like before I looked at all this, like I have definitely sent home a hell of a lot of people that uh, have had sinus bradycardias as well as uh, tachy dysrhythmias that have otherwise were negative. So um, I don't know if we're all looking at the QTC on these patients, but we should. I try to do on all these syncope patients. Um, but for me, like people come in with vital sign abnormalities in the ED at baseline. Like it's very rare to see someone in the ED that's not hypertensive and tachycardic, but technically, for this rule, they were positive if they had a heart rate above 100 or a heart rate below 55. Now, things that I think is probably more concerning that we need to rule out on every single one of these EKGs is pre-excitation syndromes um, as well as Brigada syndrome. And then the last one down here, HOCAM. This study didn't include ARVD because ARVD is some very new stuff, um, but the mortality for ARVD is very high if you miss it. So we'll talk about that. So basically, I think you need to, uh, before you can call San Francisco rule negative, you need to really look at that EKG, see if you're okay sending someone home with heart rate abnormalities, because technically on those studies, they didn't. They kept those patients. Um, and then you need to evaluate for Brugada, Wolf Parkinson, Hocum, and Long QT, just like they've done in the studies. But I would add to that that you probably should also look at not only calculating your own QTC, but also right heart strain and signs of ARVD. Now, EKGs are notoriously inaccurate when it comes to um, QTC calculation. Just anecdotal, I had a patient a couple uh, months ago that I wrote up as a case report. The QTC on the calculator automated uh, for the EKG was below 500. Calculated by hand, it was above 650. Those are hugely different numbers. So you should know how to calculate. You should know what the QTC is. Prior to discharge, what do you need to do? Well, Consider if this San Francisco's rule is negative or if it's weekly positive, you think this patient can go home with close follow-up. Ask yourself, could I be missing a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Could this be a CDA? Should I get a CT head? Most of these patients don't get a CT head, but should you get it? Maybe. Should we get a second trope, a D-dimer? Did we do a rectal exam? The reason I have these questions up here is because you look at that 5% that was missed by San Francisco. Most of them were CDAs, GI bleeds, um, uh, or miss PEs. I don't think we get D-dimer on most of the patients that come in with syncope just because we don't want to commit them to a scan. But it's something that we should consider. Um, what are we going to talk about today and what are we going to skip? Well, uh, I think probably a lecture dedicated to STEMI equivalents would be really good. Um, we, do, we try to do a lot of it in the ED. These are really hard to pick up, but if you miss them and don't send this to cath lab, uh, you're doing the patient harm. Wellen syndrome, De Winter's T waves, AVR elevation uh, with lateral inferior depression, also LMCA occlusion. This also happened in patients like severe triple vessel disease. Um, Scarbosa criteria that's been updated recently. You should know these by, the, uh, by heart, by the back of your hand, because these are the things that you're looking for on an EKG, not just a STEMI, because these are STEMI equivalents and need to go to the cath lab. The only one up here that need, doesn't need to go to the cath lab within an hour is Wellen syndrome. It needs to go within 24 by Rex. 
posterior MI. Everyone kind of knows what to look for in posterior MI, I hope. We're not going to talk about PE and aortic dissection. However, um, the first thing on your differential for someone that comes in uh, with syncope that you see either in clinic or a consult down in the ED is if this patient had syncope and chest pain, the first thing you need to rule out is dissection. And if you look at our morbidity mortality, specifically at this hospital, the patients that we've missed that have died soon after admission or down in the ED have been syncope, chest pain, aortic dissections. I think, and uh, one of the experts in this field says that anyone with hypotension and syncope, you should consider aortic dissection. The most common complaint of aortic dissection is chest pain. It's not back pain. Um, so <laughs> this is the fun part, I think. Uh, some participation here. Like, Dr. Hecker is phenomenal when it comes to EKGs. At Jewish, they do an EKG, I feel like, on every single patient. Um, and he's probably the best in their group at picking up difficult to find stuff. And there's a few in here that he couldn't get. So uh, just kind of shout out what you see. Uh, we'll go through them quick. We're going to do five conditions uh, and try to drill them in. Uh, that way we can not only apply San Francisco rule, but you can catch these on low-risk patients, potentially save lives. 15 EKGs total. So each uh, condition is going to repeat itself uh, twice and then three times. I'm going to give you five textbook EKGs that you probably have seen before, but I also could point out some kind of more difficult things to pick up. That way, uh, when you do see these, you can use all of the tools instead of just one of them. Most people that if they even think to look at EKG for these five conditions, they're only looking at the most prototypical thing, which oftentimes is not the most common. So we'll start with this one. You want to take a stab? This is probably one of the easier ones. Alex, do you have any thoughts there, brother? It could, could be delta waves, um, but if you look at the PR interval, it looks pretty good, so it's not Wolf Parkinson. Why is it pointing to those like little ditzels there in the lateral fields? What is it? Yeah, those are Q waves. Yeah, nice. How are they no, how are they not ischemic Q waves? Well, they're deep dagger-like. So if someone's got a Q wave and it's less than what they say a box thickness or 40 milliseconds, that's not ischemic. That's related to the anatomy of their heart. If someone has deep Q waves in the lateral leads or inferior with LVH, where this person definitely has Kissing's artifact, I mean, we can agree V2 is kissing the top of the R and V3. That's LVH, deep Q waves, that's hokum 100% of the time until proven otherwise. That person needs a, um, uh, an echo. Delta waves is a really good thought uh, to look for in every single one of these. Um, and the reason is, is interestingly enough, the genetics for hokum share a lot of uh, components with Wolf Parkinson. So about a third of people with hokum will also have a concaminate Wolf Parkinson. What's this one? Huh? Shout out. It's okay to be wrong. It's totally fine. You only have five conditions, so and you've already seen one of them. <laughs> that's a, nice. So that's a, that's a type A pattern. That's a left accessory pathway. Now, if you want to get really good at this, you're going to notice that maybe there's some signs of uh, right ventricle strain. What you see on a type A uh, accessory pathway is you're going to see an upright R wave here, and it's going to simulate the opposite of LVH, which is like, well, uh, not really opposite, but contralateral of LVH, right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, how you see that is you have some deep T wave inversions, uh, V1, V2, V3. This is right heart strain until proven otherwise. If someone comes in with syncope uh, with this EKG, you're going to want to make sure you rule out a PE because it looks like the right heart is strained. Uh, but then you look at the delta waves and you remember, ah, oh, type A left accessory pathway, the morphology of the EKG simulates RVH without actually being it. So it looks like RVH, but it's not. It's just Wolf Parkinson. That's an easy Wolf Parkinson. So everyone is going to probably know what this is, but how do you screw it up? Oh, the nurse calls you to the room. Doctor, what do I do? Yeah, this guy got a, got a pulse. He's like diaphoretic. What'd you say, bro? Give a note of Absolutely. So there's a lot of good evidence for giving adenosine to Wolf Parkinson's patients in SVT. That's not AFib. That's totally fine. That's totally okay. If you do it for six seconds, ten seconds, and and uh, hit him with adenosine, it's it's okay. It's going to respond to it fine. Except in the event you have AFib, Wolf Parkinson, White. So what happens with that? Well. 
you have two pathways going through the heart with Wolf, Parkinson, White, AFib. The reason why you have all these different morphologies here and voltages and time intervals of the R to R is because some of the impulses from the atria are conducting via the bundle of Kent, and others are going through this slowed AV pathway. So if you block that AV pathway, even for two or three seconds, you're going to send every single impulse through the bundle of Kent without slowing down the heart. Your heart rate's going to go from 300 about to 400s, 500s. You send the patient to V-fib and you'll kill them. It's a really easy thing to do. So when you see a fast EKG that just looks awful, um, a lot of like crazy time intervals, you shock it. Just shock it, even if they're wide awake. All right, what's this one? Yes, long QT. So this is a congenital long QT. These are the ones that we really care about, but there's other things that cause long QT. This is about 550 milliseconds. Can anyone tell me how to calculate the QTC? First off, let's define what the QT is, because a lot of people think, you know, it's the peak of the T wave. They're like, oh yeah, I'm looking at the R to R interval, and I know the rule that if the T wave is not past halfway, like I'm usually pretty good. So I look at the R to R interval, the peak of the T wave is not past halfway, it's fine. That's totally wrong. You gotta go from the very beginning of the QRS until the very end of the T wave. And it's a really easy thing to do in your head if you're looking at these fast, but make sure you're looking at the end of the T wave. What is it normalized to? Like, what's a QTC? Like, it's kind of difficult to conceptualize. Basically, what they decided is they picked an arbitrary number, which was 60, or an RR interval of one second, and normalized everything to that. Uh, how do you pick the line to measure a QTC if you have, like, a little bit of elevation and maybe a U wave after the T wave? You basically take the slope that's greatest on the decline of the T wave and intersect it with the base there, and that gives you your end of the T wave. Uh, there's two formulas. The formula that's most commonly used um, by MedCalc and other calculators, as well as the ECG, is Bazet's formula. This is fine. It's okay. Uh, QTC is the QT that's measured, which is really easy to measure, as you just count up the boxes, and then divide by the square root of the R to R in seconds. So basically, if it's 60 seconds, you divide by the square root of one second, or one. So the QT is equal to the QTC at 60 seconds, and increases or decreases based on the, uh, the R to R interval. However, Bazet's formula is not very good if you're outside of a relatively normal range. So if you're outside of the 60 to 100 range, Bazet's, or, or uh, Bazet's is probably not as good as Fadricia's. That being said, if you're doing bezettes on every patient, you're probably not going to miss a significant uh, discrepancy in your QTC that's calculated on your ECG and the, a patient you have. The way to do this fast without calculating it all by hand is if you judge by the end of the T wave, if you're not past midline on a fast um, or a reasonable EKG around 55 and up, then you're okay. Notice on this EKG here, that your T wave is not past halfway between these two R to R's. So like you, your end would be right here, and you'd be like, oh, that's totally fine. But really, just because the rate's slow, that's still a significant long QT. It'd be really easy to miss if you were just eyeballing that. Okay, next one. If you don't get this, then you got problems, man. What is it? This is like textbook. Nice, Brugada type one. Um, so overall, it's been estimated and publicized that Brugada carries a mortality about 10%. Some of the more recent stuff is saying that maybe it's really not that bad. And there was a big cohort that was followed out of Japan, like 6,000 people. Um, and they didn't notice um, any significant problems in the subgroup that had Brugada compared to the whole group. So maybe it's not as bad as we thought. However, recommendations still, if it's type 1, it needs to come in. Um, if it's type two or three, you potentially can do um, follow-up with EPS. Um, some of the more recent stuff is saying that if it's type one incidental, then maybe they don't need admission. But if they're type one and symptomatic, they need to come in for it. They're very high risk. Now, the reason that we care about type two and type three, because type one's really the one that's like, so it's the highest mortality, is type two and type three, if a patient's stressed, can turn into a type one. What are the things that stress a patient? Well, I'll talk to you about that a little bit. This is kind of a blown up image of what type one, two, and three look like. Three is basically a mix between one or two. It's just lower voltages. If your ST segment's less than two millimeters elevated, it's called a type three. If your T wave's upright, that's called a type two, also known as a saddleback. 
We all know this. What are things that can uh, cause brugada? Well, there's actually quite a bit, but um, to unmask itself, it's three of the most common. Cocaine, alcohol, and fever, like every single one of our patients that comes in with rhabdo and using a little bit of coke. So we've got to consider those patients. All right, what's this? Pretty easy. This one's a long QT. What's interesting about this patient is the T wave looks so normal. Uh, and that's because it's hypocalcemia leading to long QT because that's not going to affect necessarily the repolarization that's associated with the T wave, but it will prolong your QT. All right, what's this one? Kind of cheat a little bit on this, I'm sorry, but it's pretty interesting. First off, is this normal? Can you tell like right away that something's wrong? Yeah, the T wave's big. T wave's big, is that what you said? Yeah, T is big, but look how near it is to the QRS. It almost looks like part of the QRS. This is a syndrome that is not talked about very often. It was not part of the EKG criteria for the San Francisco rule, but it's equally concerning. This is short QT syndrome. It's congenital syndrome, very much like congenital long QT syndrome. And just like congenital long QT syndrome, it portends a very bad outcome for the patients that have it. Basically, they develop V-fib because they hit on the repole just like they would on a uh, long QT. So because the <laughs> QRS is just so freaking close to that T wave. It's a, it's a K-channel problem. Um, when do you want to be worried about this? 300 to 350 QTC is when you want to worry. This is a nice summary published in 2009 for what is a normal QT and when patients need to come in. Um, basically, the bottom line is that you got to consider both long and short QT syndromes. If you're less than 360 or greater than 450, that's a patient that should come in for observation. Now, from a medical standpoint, medical legal, these patients are really easy to bring into the hospital because all you got to do is put them on a tele bed, which bills well. You obs them for a while, maybe arrange follow up with EP guys, um, and then once you get out of the out of this place, it's an easy patient to round on and it builds pretty well. But the recommendation is that these need to come in. All right, what's this? This one's one of the more atypical presentations of a disease process you've already seen. Lauren, you got any? Our future cardiologist? Who? Is this like the raised intracranial pressure? That's a good thought. This could certainly be a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, those deep T waves, absolutely. We're talking about congenital problems, though. What is this? Absolutely. This is a rare form of hokum. Uh, this is a, a apical hokum instead of septal hokum, uh, seen mainly in Japanese patients. Giant T-wave inversions, very large voltages. Look how freaking huge that R-wave is. So you know this is abnormal. This is a patient that I don't think anyone would not get an echo on. This would be pretty easy to pick up, I think. I put it in here just to show you two things. One, that hokum does not always present with septal hypertrophy. And two, look at the PR interval on this one. It's like right there. It's like less than, it looks like maybe 40 milliseconds, if that. So this is someone that has probably WPW on top of their hokum. <laughs> Easy to miss that. All right, what about this guy? We're getting close to being done. Hang with me. Would you say that ST segment is elevated in the AVR? That's a great, that's a great pickup. I think it'd be really difficult to tell and you'd actually probably have to use a Scarbosa criteria to get that because you have a wide QRS and a discordant elevation there. That would be Scarbosa negative. But why do we have to use Scarbosa? Well, the QRS is wide. Let's look at the P waves now. How short is the interval, the, the PR? It's freaking way short. If you especially if you look at V4, V5, V6, it's even it's really hard to even see it. But where you can see P waves out there, it looks like they're almost right up against the, the QRS. This is the variant of Wolf Parkinson Y. There's two types, type A and type B. This is the other pathway, and you'll notice the findings like these huge R waves in the lateral leads looks like uh, LVH. That's because type B looks like LVH, just like type A looks like RVH. So this is a uh, right-sided accessory pathway. Um, it's a hard time, you'll have a hard time seeing the delta wave here because usually where we look at delta waves in the anterior leads, like you have a positive deflection coupled by a negative. Um, so that's why it's really difficult to pick up. But if you look at the PR interval, and I would argue on every single EKG for syncope or chest pain, look at the PR interval, just eyeball it. If it's short, that's a patient needs to come in. I had a, an attending that picked up uh, Wolf Parkinson that I initially missed because he evaluated the PR interval and it was very, very small. So that was a year back and I won't forget it. All right. 
What do we have here? First off, if we look in the lateral leads, what do we see? Dr. Bills. You have some pretty big voltages in those R waves, so you have LVH. What's that little ditzel beneath the isoelectric line before the QRS? What is that? What are these? Exactly. That's a septal hypertrophy. Those are deep dagger-like Q waves. Notice how notice how narrow those Q waves are. The down deflection is almost touching the upward deflection. It looks like it is. So those are abnormal Q waves. This is classic septal hokum. If you did not know to look for those dagger-like Q waves, you'd probably miss this. This one everyone should get. <laughs> what is this? Yep, Brugada. Easy. This was a 15-year-old patient that presented with syncope after riding a bike. Um, only effective treatment for this is ICD. All right, so getting to our last condition. What do we have here? Let's see who else is in here. Chandra, what do we got? <laughs> Sorry. What do you see? What's abnormal about this EKG? Yeah, yeah, anterior T waves. So just like our our example of the type A or uh, type A Wolf Parkinson, there's signs of right ventricular hypertrophy here uh, because you have deep inverted T waves in the anterior leads V1 through V3. Again, you're going to want to evaluate for right heart strain acutely. So you're going to ultrasound this patient. You're going to check the size of their RV. You're going to check their IVC. You're going to rule out a, a PE. But if you look up here you'll see something that's pathognomonic for a rare condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. This is probably the most recent of the conditions we're talking about today. Just published really in the last 10, 15 years, more like 10. Um, Epsilon waves is a double ditzel, sometimes just one uh, small elevation after the QRS before the T wave, immediately after the QRS. It's only 30% specific, um, but and it's only on it's only on 30% of EKGs that shouldn't be specific. It's only on 30% of EKGs for people with confirmed ARVD. Um, what other things are you going to look for? Well, anytime you got uh, inverted T waves in the anterior leads, you're going to want to evaluate could this be an ARVD. Also, they'll have a slurred S wave, which is the S wave is right here. This S wave is a little bit longer than what it would be um, otherwise, and that's because the Epsilon wave blurs it into the ST segment. Why is it important? Well, ARVD is a infiltration, like fatty tissue into the and the RV uh, that causes this tachydysrhythmia. That's what it looks like. That's a patient with ARVD, and they'll go back and forth between this as well as this AKG, and they'll come in sometimes with complaints of palpitations. Oftentimes, they're misdiagnoses like PVCs, and they'll just go back and forth between this and this. It's the weirdest thing. There's an enlarged picture of what an epsilon wave looks like. A couple more EKGs. I think there's like five left and we'll be done. This is type 2 Brugada. This is one of the ones that Hecker couldn't even pick up. If you look at the V1 and V2, you can kind of see a saddle back there. This would be a tough one. This is really interesting. Uh, this is an ARVD patient, but you'll see the evolution of the uh, epsilon wave as we go in time. It gets broader and wider and less sharp. Um, that's because arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia is a dysplastic process that gets worse over time. Uh, eventually, it becomes broader, blunter, and later. So you get more and more of this slurred S wave. Um, how do you diagnose it? Well, really, if you get a board question on it, it's cardiac MRI is the test of choice. But you start with an echo. What do you see on echo? Well, you're going to see a dilated RV, dilated right ventricle outflow track. Um, and then when you get the cardiac MRI, you're going to see this fibro fatty infiltration of the RV. You also see thinning there as well. And then sometimes the thinning causes aneurysms and dilation. What do you treat it with? Well, you give a beta blocker. The only one that's shown to be effective right now is Sotolol. And then high-risk people get an ICD just like Regatta. All right. What's going on here? I think this is kind of a hard one. This is actually the second EKG of the patient. The first EKG was that. <laughs> This is a young guy that came in with syncope, and the ED doc triaged the troponin. Most people wouldn't have done an otherwise healthy kid. This was the second EKG. So you can see between the first and the second, you have some T-wave inversions in these leads here. This is an atypical presentation of ARVD, and there's no way you pick it up without seeing this EKG first. And even if you had this EKG, I think it'd be really hard to see. How did they find it? Well, when they uh, did his trope, it came back at above three. 
So he got an echo and a cardiac MRI. This is a healthy 31-year-old kid. Um, also notice the slurred S wave. It, I think that's really hard to pick up. Um, we talked about the fiber fatty replacement of the right ventricular myocardium. 20% of patients with sudden cardiac death, one-fifth of them overall out of everyone included in the pool have this, and this is something that a lot of people have never even heard of, so something we definitely need to consider about. It's one in 5,000, which sounds like uh, sounds like very uncommon, but if you look at the presentation and the uh, epidemiology of some of the other illnesses we treat here commonly, like one in 5,000 is really not that uncommon. And why do we care about it? Well, these patients can look healthy and look great, then die the next day, and die at a young and kind of inappropriate age to die, I think. All right, so what do we talk about today? Hokum, pre-excitation syndromes, long QT, Brugada, ARVD. Thank you guys uh, for taking all our calls in the evening. We appreciate you, and uh, anytime you want to come talk with us about things you think we can do better, we would really like to hear it, and thanks for having me.